But like I said, even if you didn't really understand the readings very well or had a hard time grasping them, that's okay because the point is just to um, to engage with it. We're going to discuss it and talk about it a little bit and try to pick out some pieces that it can at least lend to the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so I'll give you, like I said, about one more minute on your bell ringer. We'll talk about this, then we'll move on to our discussion. Now, remember, in our discussion part, this is part of your grade. You'll get a daily grade for this. So in order to get the grade, you have to contribute to the discussion, okay? What I'm looking for is for you to have something, at least one point or question, to add to the conversation. And I'd like to see everyone at least respond at least once to something that a peer says or that I say or something like that. So that's going to be the first half of class. Like I said, in the second half of class, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about Puritan contributions to the American way of life. And then we will... Um, from there, we will move on to our next set of readings, which is, I think you guys actually have a couple. Yeah, uh, there's a few readings for this next time. There's two poems and then two other, two other readings that we'll have to do. So a little bit more to read next time. Um, and the readings for tonight or for the next couple of days that we'll talk about on Thursday are gonna continue to focus on the Puritans in their early days. We'll get a little bit more of their um, their mindset and political uh, beliefs and religious beliefs and social beliefs and all that good stuff. So. Has anyone here heard anything from Nora? Anyone in contact with her at all? I can't remember if she went virtual or if she's just out today. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about this. So let's just real quick to kind of kick our conversation off today and kind of start getting the ball rolling. Why, first off, would you think that either of these two readings are important to the American literary canon? And how, in your opinion, how do they relate to this American identity that we've been talking about? Genesis? Because the whole idea of the American identity clause is to split up the American Sorry, what now? But the whole idea of the American identity started from Okay, yes. So in these readings, one of the things that's important is because in these readings, what we start to see are these kind of, like I said last time, these sort of seeds being planted, these very early, I guess, more rustic ideas, beliefs, approaches to life that eventually evolve into really what, like I said earlier, what turns into the ideals that are written into the Constitution. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today with Puritanism, how the ideals that the Puritans brought with them from England and kind of um, uh, initiated here on American soil, you know, over the years, the religious aspect of that kind of fades away. You know, understand the Founding Fathers, while they were what we would call theists, Okay, everyone knows the difference between a basically a theist and an atheist. Okay, atheist is without belief in any higher being whatsoever. Okay, theist is just a very broad term to say that you believe in a creator, in a God of some sort. Okay, so atheist is absolutely no belief, but theist is a belief in God. It doesn't necessarily have to be specific. Christians are theists. Um, Muslims are theists, Jews are theists, okay, they believe in a God, there's nothing specific, but even though our founding, and our founding fathers, a lot of them were actually what's called deists, and that is a sort of a belief that, um, and this is actually going to, we're going to talk about this as we move forward, because one of the interesting things about deism as a philosophical and religious belief is that it basically, and this is oversimplifying it, but it basically says that God exists, a God exists, that God created the universe, um, everything that was came out of that is created. However, they don't necessarily believe that God is directly involved in everyday life. They don't believe that God is necessarily pulling the strings behind everything. There's one, uh, there's one idea about in Deism where we talk about God being the great clock maker. God wound up the clock, set it down, and then walked away. Okay? There's belief that God exists and that God is good and that God did good things and put good things into the earth. But when he put him, humans on the earth, he just kind of let us go. And let us do our own thing. It doesn't really get involved too much. That's a stark contrast between what the Puritans believe 
which was that God was pulling the strings on every little bitty tiny event that happened. An ant crawls across your desk. That was willed by God. All right, and so there's a there's a midway point between those two kind of radical beliefs in Catholicism, but we're not getting too much into that in this classroom because this isn't your religion class. But it is important to understand the difference. And don't get me wrong, some of the founding fathers, me and the founding fathers were Christian. They were still Christian, but a lot of them were also like Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, potentially George Washington, Hamilton, people like that, leaned more towards this Enlightenment-style perspective of deism. And again, that's important to understand because... As we move along, we're going to kind of see how the religious aspect of the Puritans kind of fades, but those ideals that they brought with them grow in a more secular way. Okay? What else? Who else has something? Who can they, you know, why do they think that these writings relate to the American identity or something like that? Who wants to say, what else do we have? Why would you, any other reason as to why these, why these might be important? Why we might include things like New England's trials? Ava? Um. Because they help us get an idea of what the Puritans were and how they, um, how they, um, how things like evolved. Is that what you Okay, perfect. Yes, that's a very good point. Another reason that these are important again, because not these aren't. This is long before the um, the patriotic mentality of breaking away from England really started to show its head. But it does show us, again, like you said, it shows us kind of where we come from, how our ideas and how our beliefs and how our identities as Americans developed. And so we go back, well, the reason these are important to the American literary cast is we go back and we see all these original writings and these things that were taking place long before the patriotic identity came out, and then we can kind of trace it as its evolution over the years. Anybody else have something they want to kind of start here? How about progress between the how they perceived um, others. Very how, good. Like, we see it now to where like we're all equal but that's where there is no good great situation between Very good. That's uh that's very good and that's also very true. So what she said was it kinda allows us to see how our uh how our views on equality change and where they started and where they go and how people from the past kind of viewed others, especially like the way that the settlers viewed the natives. We see two kind of different perspectives on that. We see with William Bradford's writing, things start off a little contentious. There's some stuff in there about the natives like stealing tools and things like that. And but in you know in the John Smith readings, I don't know if you picked up on it or not, but it's all about hostility with the natives. All every 100% hostile. And so yeah, and so and, and that's actually something very interesting. Um, if you were to move out to the western side of the country, because you know the colonists and the British who came over and started America. They kept mostly to the east. The original 13 colonies are all situated on the east. The landmass that is America, right, has it's always been here. Back in those 14, 15, 1600s, there were French and Spanish missionaries and settlers in sort of the western part of the United States. It's really interesting, and there's a book that none of you are ever going to read. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> but uh, there's a really interesting book about the foundations of Catholic education in America. And what, you, what, I, what I found interesting about that is the way that the Spanish and the French approached the natives, while it was still not, nobody during that time really came over from Europe and looked at the Native Americans and said, you know, this is a valid way of life. They still saw them as savages. They still saw them as, you know, sort of like these prehistoric, uneducated, uncultured people. And so even though in the Western, the Spanish and the French missionaries did what they could to try and bring civilization to them, they still treated them like human beings for the most part. They tried to teach them, they tried to educate them, they tried to sort of assimilate them into the modern, more European, Christian way of life. Um, when you get into Britlet, we're going to see kind of how this idea that Christianity brings with it modernization wherever it goes. Um, it's, a, it's a theme that plays out all over the world, but it was kind of the approach they took them. The colonists didn't really do that. The colonists found themselves at odds with the natives quite a bit. Um, drove them out, went to war with them. In some situations, they made alliances here and there. I mean, it's not, it's not perfectly black and white, but the approach to the natives in the eastern and the colonies, the British colonies as opposed to the west, very different, very different perspective over the years. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit. Let's go ahead and get into our discussion. Um, I'm going to let y'all, and this part, I want you guys to kind of help um, facilitate this conversation. This is where you bring your ideas to the table. So remember, everyone has to contribute a little bit. So let's start, which one do you want to start with? Do you want to start with New England's Trials, or do you want to start with Plymouth Plantation? Mm -hmm. Say again? Mm -hmm. 
Plantation, you want to start with this one? Okay, let's start with Plymouth Plantation. So what we're going to be looking at today are two writings that come from two different sections of what I said being the American identity. Okay? And so at Plymouth Plantation, we have William Bradford, who, as we learned in our last class, was a, um, a pilgrim, a separatist, who came over on the Mayflower, signed the Mayflower Compact, served as governor of the Plymouth Colony on and off for close to 30 years, okay, and wrote a lot about this. So I guess to start off, is there anything in the reading here, anything in the reading here that you saw, first off, any section, any line, any sentence, anything that you want to make a comment about or start the conversation with? Who would like to get things rolling? Okay. Okay, so I said, um, when you were talking about the election, how the fact that um, the who the who conquered slaves that America was ordained by God. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that it started probably from American Indian because he talked about God a lot. Mm -hmm. He talked about how God was like the main reason for everything that was happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what Kenley's talking about, when one of the themes we talked about in, in understanding the American identity, the American approach to life in our last class was this sort of, like she said, she's the word subconscious, which is very good, the subconscious belief, and not always subconscious. A lot of people will sit there and tell you straight up that this is, this is the case, but everyone sort of carries with them this sort of subconscious belief, especially in the early days, that what they were doing in America was completely and totally willed by God. That America is an ine was, was seen as an inevitable ex thing to exist, okay? Something that was going to exist no matter what. That God planned it that this is God's will, that this is something that must exist, this is something that we have a right to, this is, this is a good country, a good experiment, this must be a thing. We are in, by establishing America in the New World, we're on this sort of, um, this divine uh, um, adventure, okay? Now, the early colonists may not have had that specific in mind because they weren't necessarily looking at founding a new country so much as they were just a place where they could go worship freely without pr prosecution. But as she said, there's a lot of talk in this uh, in here about God being very involved in the little things. And so with the Puritan ideology that God is involved in absolutely everything. And I'll try to be a little nuanced when I talk about this a little bit because it's hard. Because on the one hand, we do believe, especially as Christians, we do believe that God does have a hand in everything. There's a difference in believing, though, that God sort of is present in everything, and available, and there, and then the fact that God is literally like the Wizard of Oz, like behind the scenes, like writing out, like writing out like a D&D &D kind of story or something like that. Every single idea and detail is just like written down and planned and perfect and everything like that. That's the Puritan belief, that God is pulling the strings absolutely everything that happens. Like I said a second ago, an ant crawls across your desk, that's God's will. That was divinely created and meant to happen by God, Okay. So what we're seeing, let's look at a couple passages. As mapping that first paragraph, look there. And I'm actually going to start from the very beginning because there's some interesting stuff here. In sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the sea so high as they could not bear a knot of sail. In sundry, sundry just means an indefinite number. All right? So basically, if we recall last time, the pilgrims were actually on their way um, to Virginia. And storms blew them off course and they ended up at Plymouth. Okay? So in sundry of these storms, in many of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the sea so high as they could not bear a knot of sail, but were forced to hold for divers days together. Divers means several, several days together. And in one of them, as they thus lay at hole in a mighty storm, a lusty young man named called John Howland, coming, on, coming upon some occasion above the gratings, was with a seal of the ship thrown into sea. But it pleased God that he caught hold of the top sail halyards, which hung overboard and ran out at length. So this is lusty means strong, by the way, in this, this raid. So right off the bat, we have him. So we have basically all that scene is showing us is that we have a guy who comes up from the bottom of the ship, gets knocked off the ship. And as he's falling, he grabs onto something to try and save himself and right there. But it pleased God that he caught a hold of the top cell halo. So right off the bat, even, notice how even in these minute details, and I mean, I'm sure in the moment, being knocked off a ship in a storm isn't minute to you, but even in these things that have, you know, all these little details, you're going to see that he talks about how it pleased God for this to happen. It pleased God for this to happen. So yes, he is he is showing us right off the bat this Puritan ideology that God is there and involved in every little bitty thing, blessing every little bitty thing that we do. If you move on over to page 63, 
up at the top. But after they had sailed that course about half the day, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and they were so far entangled therewith as they conceived themselves in great danger and the wind shrinking upon them withal. They resolved to bear up again for the cape and thought themselves happy to get out of those dangers before night overtook them, as by God's good providence they did. So they're, they're talking about trying to get to land while on the ship. And again, showing, thanks to God, God steered our ship. He, and again, understand that when the uh, Puritans hit in Plymouth, this belief that they're carrying with them that they've been knocked off course, they're still going to accept that this is what was meant to happen, that all these storms they're going through are necessary. All these storms on the ship they're going through are purposeful and made by God. And you're going to see this. This is actually, we're going to be able to draw a parallel between this idea and some of the other readings we're going to do. Literally, think about the storm as not just being something that literally happened, but a metaphor for what the pilgrims and the Puritans are going to go through. You're going to see this again in more readings. But this idea of going through a storm, going through hard times, going through trials, and being brought out on the other end of it by nothing else other than divine providence, that is going to be a key belief in Puritan and early pilgrim ideology because they did go through not just literal storms, but metaphorical ones too. They had a hard time finding food. They had to defend themselves. They had a lot of actual trials they went through. And this belief that God is bringing them through all of it is going to stay strong throughout, um, throughout all of these readings we're going to do. One more section right there, the next paragraph. Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought to safe land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again, to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. So again, we have a lot, really strong imagery, really strong uh, wording here that's showing us about the strong belief that God is with them through everything that they do, that he's leading them on the way, no matter what the trials may be, God is with them and putting them through this. And you know, and you could also probably argue that to agree that this is a test, all these trials are a test. Again, that's a theme that's going to come up in some of our later readings. Okay, so who? Anybody have anything to add to that? To add to what Kinley just said? Anything else that you noticed, or something that you might want to add on to that? I was kind of shows how much they like believed in God, mm-hmm. like, get them through stuff, and I'm like, oh, yes, it's like if they wanted, they needed to, they like pray. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, and then he's like, if they got through, then he blessed them all, mm-hmm. and how much, and it kind of shows since he says God a lot in like some of Ken's verses. So faith is very strong for the Puritans. It's a very, very strong element. It dominates their entire way of life. And, you know, what's interesting about this is we're going to see this. This kind of brings us to something else. In all of our American identity today, despite the fact that we are a nation um, that is made up of multiple different cultures, races, religions, would you consider faith in general to still be a very important part of the American identity? Yes. I mean, and it is. I mean, regardless of whether or not, you know, what you believe in, overall, faith really does play a role, at least to some degree. I mean, we hear the word, the name God, it's on our money, even though some of that didn't happen until the 1950s. But, like, it's on our money, it's in our, um, it's in our pledge. We have invocations before... Events. Um, anybody here familiar with the priest Father James Martin? Ever heard of him before? He's a Jesuit Catholic priest, really popular um, priest. He's saying a prayer at the Democratic National Convention. He prayed as one of the you know three or four different faith leaders that prayed an opening invocation prayer at the Democratic National Convention that kicked off yesterday. Okay, there was an imam that prayed. There was a I believe a rabbi that prayed. Father Martin prayed. I think there's a couple others, but they had. Even the Democratic National Convention, they had a handful of people come and say a prayer before they got started. Um, in the current election, right now, there's an election happening. If you listen to what um, the candidates say, if you kept up with the primaries, we didn't really have a Republican primary because there's a Republican incumbent, but if you listen to the Democratic primaries at all, the concept of faith comes up quite a bit. People talk about God all the time. So despite the fact that America is a nation of technically speaking, is a secular nation. And even though not everybody is a Christian, and certainly very few people are actual Puritans like they were back in the day, faith, in any kind of form, remains a very important part of the American identity overall. 
And that freedom of religion, all right, the freedom of religion is a very important part too. And like I said, what these Pur even though the Puritans were fairly, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Even though the Puritans weren't very open to other religions, this idea of freedom of religion, this is where this has its roots, okay? So, yeah, so anything else about that? Who wants any other comments about faith as a part of the way of life, the Puritan approach? You can even give me your personal opinion on what you think about this sort of approach, this idea. I think it's good to have faith. And, like, I think it's good that everyone can be saved or whatever faith they have, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's too much, um, like, too much, I mean, I'm going to say it. There's, like, there needs to be more of a separation between religion and uh, government. Okay, more of a separation between church and state, right? Yeah. So that's going to be an interesting point that we're going to see. In the early days, and you'll notice this as we read some more, in the early days, faith did dominate every aspect of life, legal and spiritual and social, okay? But over the hundred years or so, we have written to our Constitution by the Founding Fathers, you know, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of, I don't know exactly what the wording, but you know, the freedom of religion is written there, and, and what it really talks about in that in our Constitution, in our Bill of Rights, is that Congress cannot compel you to believe anything. Um, the state cannot compel you to believe anything, and the state is not supposed to operate based off of any one theology. Right? So the separation of church and state is an important thing, but an interesting point to think, bring up here. In the early days, we're going to notice that there's very real, very little real separation of church and state. If you go back and look through the history... Um, there was uh, the church and the state were a lot, especially Christianity, were actually a lot more entwined, um, you know, for a long time, well up and through the 1800s. Um, the secularization of our government is a topic of debate, but at least on the surface, um, it really has never worked out perfect. There's never, do you think there's ever really been a true? Perfect separation of church and state in the United States of America. No. Do you think there can be? Yes. yes. How? I think that there just should be, I mean, laws, but there are a lot of laws that are based on people's moral opinions mm -hmm. that tie into their religion. Mm -hmm. And so if we eliminated those and just made it be all like a legal thing, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't be like. There are laws that are based today on people's religious beliefs, and that's not false. And especially at the state level, there are a lot of people who are writing legislation and laws based off of what they believe to be an interpretation of the Christian identity. But what if I were to tell you that I believe that part of my Christian faith uh, and my Christian beliefs are that we should be focusing a lot more on making sure people don't go hungry? Does that change? Your perception of that at all? I mean, I think we should write a law that says that everyone should have right and a right to food. That no matter how much money you have, I'm just using an example here. I actually do believe everyone has a right to eat, but just an example. Everyone, we should write a piece of legislation that says everybody should have a right to food. So whether you can pay for it or not, regardless of what you believe, regardless of how much money you have, if you're hungry, you get food no matter what. Does anyone here disagree with that? You think anybody should go hungry? What if I told you that my entire basis for believing in that is because of my faith in God and nothing else? Because to me, God says, feed the hungry. Jesus said that, didn't he? In the Bible, it's right there. Feed the hungry. So I believe we should write legislation to make sure the hungry are fed because of my religious belief. It's not, but do you disagree with that? No, but we don't disagree not because it's a Christian belief, but we disagree because that's a moral belief. Because it's a moral belief, it's a justice belief, but where do those morals come from initially for each individual person? Religion. Not always it's religion. Well, not both well, more than way. But I'm saying that it shouldn't be a like, you, it's okay to have this moralization based on your religion, but it should not, a consensus should not be found from religious morality. It should just be found from people of all, you know, moral points. So what you're saying is, is that your belief can be, can influence this legislation, but everyone should have to come to a consensus regardless of their beliefs in that piece of legislation, right? Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I do agree with that. But, the, but, to, but when, when I talk about the separation of faith and the true separation of church and state, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's impossible. Now, what you can do 
is you can have, like you said, nuance and context. And I can say, I think everyone should be fed, and here's why I believe this, and this is my reasoning for doing it. I can put that on the table, and then we can debate it, and everyone can bring their perspective to the table and decide whether or not that's a good piece of legislation or, a good, or something that's good for everyone for a myriad of reasons, right? But there are other things, like, for example, um, well... In that example of everybody being happy and being peaceful, mm -hmm. if everyone did agree on that, would it then not be not a peace? Like, if everybody agreed on that, what their morally right and feel like talking to religion, wouldn't that not be a religious thing then? Because your personal moral beliefs are based off religion, but the idea that we all come to an agreement on isn't truly based off everyone's religious beliefs, just morality. Correct. Which isn't Right. Well, everyone's morality comes from a different place for the most part. Well, there's a theological debate to be had there. But functionally, everyone develops their own morals and ethics from a different place. Some people develop them from just experience. Some people develop them from purely political ideas. Some people develop them from purely religious ideas. fact of the matter is you're always going to have people in the seat of government, no matter what side of the political spectrum they land on, that they're going to support certain pieces of legislation and certain policies because of their specific religious beliefs. Whether or not everybody agrees is a different story. You still have to get through the democratic process. But the fact that you have people making decisions in government who are inspired, a lot of people who are inspired by their personal, moral, um, religious convictions, that aspect will never go away. That's what, what I'm getting at. So that's where that nuance kind of comes in. And this, this is probably a conversation a little bit better held for your government class. But, it's, but that's something important to understand. Separation of church and state is kind of a... It's kind of a difficult conversation when you really start to peel back the layers and talk about what this really, really means. Um, but you could, let's take the argument for same-sex marriage, though, and let's talk about that. Um, and I'm not going to fall on either side of any of these arguments. I have my own personal beliefs, but it's not my job to tell you what I believe. Um, so, But let's talk about that aspect by itself. The argument behind that was that we live in a, technically, we live in a secular society, right? Technically, we do. We have freedom of religion. We live in a secular society. And so the question was put to the people, what is the non-religious reason that we shouldn't allow same-sex couples to enjoy in the same tax benefits, which is basically what marriage is on a legal level, hold truly, okay? Let's not, let's not kid ourselves here. Marriage, without religion, and purely from a legal perspective, is just a tax form. That's all it is. It's actually very true in Alabama now because we got rid of, um, we changed the way we do that. But the fact of the matter is, is that when, that when that debate came around, a lot of people were against it because they're of their religious beliefs, right? And that's okay. If you're against it because of your specific religious beliefs, that's your belief. You know, for example, as Catholics, we have a very specific view of marriage. So it doesn't just, it does not just opposed to same-sex marriage, but a lot of different perspectives on marriage, okay? A lot of different, it's a very, because it's a sacrament, right? And for us, for Catholics... It's a very specific thing, but can we as Catholics apply our specific approach of sacramental marriage to a secular government regarding just tax benefits? No. Some would argue you could, but ultimately the answer was no, that you can't. And that's an example, I think, of what you're talking about, is you did have people bring to the table, God says we're not supposed to do this, so we shouldn't do it as a law. And the response to that was, well, you may believe that, and that's fine, but from a secular perspective, which is what our government's supposed to be, secular government, separation of church and state, can you come up with a good argument as to why same-sex couples shouldn't get the same tax benefits as married couples? That's really, if you really want to peel it back, what it comes down to from a legal perspective. Because all the arguments about love and all that jazz, that is, that's more personal. That's between you and yourself and, and God or whatever you believe, okay? But on a functional, applicable level, that's how it breaks down. What's the legal reason for this? Okay? So that's an example of what you're kind of thinking what you're talking about, too. You can't, we can't just say... Well, no one, you know, two men who are who say they're in love with each other shouldn't be allowed to get married because of my religious beliefs. Well, technically our government, our constitution says, well, no, that's not, that's, you can't do that because we're secular. So we have, to, and the, but we have these arguments because you could say, there, there, it, the possibility was that you could have found, and some people have argued whether or not they were affected or not, that there are secular reasons for opposing same-sex marriage. If there are non-religious reasons for opposing same-sex marriage, some people have argued that. Um, but ultimately, this argument certainly went out. Yes? Isn't that kind of the same thing with, like, um, pro-life and pro-choice? Because, like, pro-life, they kind of say that you should not do it mostly for, like, religious beliefs. Like, kind of like on the side, kind of like on the side.
kind of religiously because it's like a lot of pro life people are Christian. Yeah. Um, that's true, but there are also a lot of pro life people out there who are. There's actually a whole uh, subgroup of the pro life um, movement that are um, that are atheists, and their uh, anti abortion stance is in a humanist belief. The so and for most of the conversation, you're right. For most of the conversation, or for most of that conversation, you're right. It's, it usually tends to be. And not, not every religious person is, is pro-life. There are, you'll find plenty of people who agree that they're pro-choice and um, uh, religious at the same time. The thing about that argument is that the difference, and I'm going to just real quick, the difference there, and this is how it can be different, is that you can actually take that argument and move it away from religion pretty easily because, and, and, and focus strictly on what, what a biology textbook says. Because you, could make, you can make a very clear, observable argument that the fetus inside the womb is still a human being, which scientifically it very much is. I mean, there's no, there's no, it's, it's a, it's a stage of human development. And therefore, because it's human and therefore, because it has a heartbeat at very young, six weeks, or because of the fact that even before a heartbeat exists, it has its very own specific code of DNA already written into it. Therefore, it's a human life that you shouldn't abort it because that would be any human life. That. So it's easy to kind of pull the religion out of that. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that can be made into a more legalistic, scientific argument than a religious argument. Um, so it's a little bit different than the same thing. Because what you're yeah. dealing with is the because truthfully, the implication there is that if you're dealing dealing with abortion, that's a um, uh, dealing with same-sex marriage. That's a that's a moralistic issue. But like I said, at the end of the day, it comes down to it. Really, just comes down to a tax issue, a legal issue. Um, what, why should same-sex couples not be allowed to enjoy the same legal benefit, benefits of legal marriage and heterosexual? What's your argument against that? Hard to pull that away from the religious perspective. Move it over to abortion, you can pull that away by saying, well, because the fetus is a human in a stage of human development, therefore to end its life would be wrong because we have laws against murder and ending human life in general. So if this is a human life, why should we expand it? So that's how you can separate that argument, and that's how that becomes less of a religious thing However, the argument often stays in religious circles, um, and that's a very complicated issue in that respect. Um, but let's um, let's move back to this a little bit because I don't want to get too off topic. This is good. This is exactly the kind of thing I'm looking for in this class because we're still thinking about that American identity. This is all still connects to how faith and morals and ethics play into that American perspective. In countries where you have a state church, it's a lot easier to say we're not going to have same-sex marriage. Because you have a state church, right? A state, uh, a church, or a religion that is recognized by the state. You have that in a lot of Middle Eastern countries. You have that in some Central European countries. A state church, so it's a little bit easier to make the religious argument over there. But in America, it's different because we have this concept of separation of church and state and religious freedom. See? And that also kind of ties back to this idea of us being a nation of ideals and ideas that are... That our, um, that our identity is tied more to morals and ethics than it is some sort of ancestral blood perspective. Does that make sense? What else do we have? Anything else from the other side, um, from chapter 11 or on? Yeah. Um, they made a treaty. They made a treaty? Yes. Okay. That's. I'm glad you brought that up. So are you talking about the section there on 64, where it lists off the six? Okay, so let's, let's read that real quick. Um, so this whole section, let's, let's actually just read this whole section under Indian relations real quick. All this while the Indians came skulking about them and would sometimes show themselves aloof, off, but when any approached near them, they would run away. And once they, the Indians, stole away the colonists' tools where they had been at work and were gone to dinner. But about the 16th of March, a certain Indian came boldly amongst them and spoke to them in broken English, which they could all well understand but marveled at. At length, they understood by, dis- they understood by discourse with him that he was, not one- he was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern parts where some English ships came to fish. And what, real quick, that section right there that we just read, at length, they understood by discourse with him that he was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern parts where some English ships came to fish. So what does that say about this particular Indian? What do we know about him by just reading that little section? That he has encountered the He's already encountered the English, so he's picked up a little bit of the language, maybe a little bit of their approach to life, their understanding, things like that, so he can communicate with these guys a little bit, right? Very good. 
with whom he was acquainted and could name sundry of them by their names amongst whom he had got his language. He became profitable to them in acquainting them with many things concerning the state of the country in the east where he lived, which was afterwards profitable unto them. So basically what he's saying, he's showing, he's showing these English people how to kind of work the land here in America, what to know about, what to, you know, it's kind of like, basically like a guide showing you where all the good places to eat and shop and stuff are. If you want. Um, his name was uh, Samoset. He told them of another Indian whose name was Squanto, a native of, his, of this place, who had been in England and could speak better English than himself. Being after some time of entertainment and gifts dismissed, a while after he came again, and five more with him, and they brought again all the tools that were stolen away before and made way for some for the coming of their great Sachem, called Massasoit, who about four or five days later came with the chief of his friends and another in attendance, and another attendant, with the aforesaid Squanto, with whom, after friendly entertainment and some gifts given him, they made a peace with him which hath now continued this twenty-four years in these terms. One, that neither he nor any of his should injure or do harm to any of their people. That if any of, the, any of his did hurt to any of theirs, he should, be, he should send the offender that they might punish him. That if anything were taken away from any of theirs, he should cause it to be restored, and they should do the like to his. Number four, if any, if any did unjustly war against him, they would aid him. If any did war against them, he should aid them. He should, number five, he should send to his neighbor's confederates to certify them of this, that they might not wrong them, but might be likewise comprised of the conditions of peace. And six, when, the, when then their men came to them, they should leave their bows and arrows behind. Okay? So, here's something interesting about this, and i got one more point about this after we get part, done with this part. I want to see what you guys think about. So, in this, um, in this sort of, this sort of setting up this sort of almost this peace treaty, this legal agreement, um, we're kind of combining that with the Mayflower Compact. What we're kind of seeing take place here, very slowly, very subtly, fractured but happening, is this little bit of a stronger approach to the Pilgrims starting to really, um, I don't want to say lay claim to, even though that's what they're doing, but really starting to kind of make this new world their own. They've already signed their own form of government. They've got this agreement that they're going to use to kind of I'll work this out with them. They go and they make this treaty with the Indians. And all this stuff they're doing, all these legal things that they're doing, like I said, very subtly, kind of fractured, probably not really recognizing that happening at first, but all these little legal things that they're doing, you're starting to see people take a little bit more direct control over their lives instead of being directly answerable to the king. You're seeing these very subtle movement towards self-reliance, self-government. We don't need the king to do these treaties and things for us. We can manage this stuff ourselves. Again, probably not the mindset right off the bat that they're thinking with, but it's what's happening. You're seeing that development of this idea of self-government, self-preservation, handling these things on their own, and it's kind of starting to roll up a little bit. Now, I understand these kind of things happened a lot, not just with a king all the time, but the fact that it's happening here at this place in time in America, while all these other things are developing at once, it's just one more thing to help show that development of this self-government, the people taking care of themselves, democratic idea. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that, Mandy? you have any other thoughts on that at all? Anything that you specifically thought? Is that in line with where you were going with, or did you have did that stand out to you for any particular reason? Um, I was actually going to do um, historic focus because uh, that summer plantation is about how they made the treaty. Mm -hmm. And the Indian account is where, like, um, like, John Smith made him about how... Um, You're on the right track. Like, he was forcing the Indians to do this. Very good. So we can talk a little bit. If we want to step away for just a moment from the American idea, actually, we could tie this into something. But this is this is good. Talking about sort of the differences in our approach, you know, we have William Bradford making, you know, kind of treaties and stuff with the Americans when in our early, or the Native Americans with where John Smith, he's talking more about being at war with them. Notice at the beginning here he talks about how these Indians came and stole stuff from them, but then they returned it and then they made these peace treaties. It's a little bit of a different approach than our explorer hero man, which was about a minute, John Smith took, right? Quite different. Okay? So I like that. That's a really good point to make. 
So something to think about if you later on down the line when we're writing essays, um, you don't not everything you have to write about has to tie directly to the American identity. That's the broad objective of this overall thing. But you can write maybe some comparing contrasting notes about the differences between our approach to natives in different times um, that we uh, that we showed up here. Okay. That's a very good. Thank you. Anybody have something that they want to say or respond to that? Anything that is that interesting? Any thoughts on that at all to you about the difference in Indian relations? Honestly, from like John Smith and like both of their point of views, it kind of shows how like one was more on a peaceful approach of like more sharing more mm -hmm. and not really forcing them out, while the other was more of no, they have to get on. This is our land, not theirs. Do you think that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Do you think at all that that might have something to do with the faith element a little bit? You know, is it what? Okay, so I think that has to do with the faith element because I think think about saying you think thought everything is like they put God into everything mm -hmm. that they thought they were the chosen people and that everybody else was just you just um. Uh, kind of like pawns. Yeah, subjects. yeah, okay. yeah. Kind of like pawns or subjects in God's plan, and they were the chosen ones. Yeah, like okay. like Moses taking the Israelites out of Egypt. Yeah, kind of like the That's chosen. Right. I'm glad that you said that. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. The, so um, it was like they're the chosen ones, and all these other people are pawns. So get out of our land. Okay. For that reason. So you can so that that's very interesting because you're going to see some discrepancies in the Puritan approach to natives a little bit. But on let's go back two steps real quick. On one hand, we can think about this idea that um, you know God is in everything. These are faith much more. I mean, everybody had a level of faith back in these days, but these Puritans had this very strict perspective on the faith. Believe that God is in everything. God is with everything. They still are going to adhere. To things like the Ten Commandments, you shouldn't kill, right? Even though they do, if they deem it justifiable. But maybe their faith allows them to be a little bit more approachable, a little bit more willing to have peace with the Indians. Whereas John Smith, who came, who did not come to America for um, for religious reasons, who came to America for uh, reasons of personal gain, exploration, adventure. John Smith came to America looking for adventure looking for business, looking to make money, looking to make a name for himself, right? As an adventurer, right? He's an explorer. He's a merchant. He's a mercenary. He was all these things. He comes for different reasons. So he probably has a little bit more incentive to be a little bit more hostile towards the natives than these early Puritans did, in which they're trying to establish these kind of relations with them. But it's something you mentioned about the Exodus, that's actually true. We're going to talk about that in a little while. They really did liken their approach uh, um, their journey from England to America with the exodus from the Bible. That was something specific. They saw themselves like the Israelites, moving, uh, leaving Egypt and going to their promised land. You're also going to see that even though that they actually do look at the Native Americans as sort of pawns in overall God's plan, and something that you're really going to want to think about, um, between the storms, between the approach to the Indian relations, and as we're going to read a little bit in Captivity and Restoration of Mary Rowlandson, which is one of going to be something you'll read in a minute, is that this, I, this belief that God is constantly testing the Puritans. Everything is a test, so how do they react? And if you're going through life thinking everything is a test by God, it doesn't matter if you necessarily believe if these Indians or these Native Americans are human or worthy in God's eyes. What matters is, is, is this a test by God? How are we supposed to approach this? So they're thinking with everything with that in mind. You also have this, if, you, if we read over, another reason that they might also be a little bit more willing to do this is because under that part on chapter 12, they talk about how, um, you know, for the first year or so, they had some serious hardships, lost a lot of people there's uh, there's talking here about them losing people over the first couple years of being there um and so as they start to gain a footing and they start to they realize that you know relations with the indians are a little bit easier to help us survive um put a pin in that and then go back over to chapter 11 the starving time something to something to notice real quick okay notice this real quick 
All right, the starting time. But that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time, half of their company died, especially in January and February, being the depth of winter and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with the scurvy and other diseases which this long voyage and their in, in accommodate condition had brought upon them. So as there died sometimes two or three of a day in aforesaid time, that of a hundred and odd persons, scarce fifty remain. So people are dying, is what it's just saying. People are dying. This is the starving time. They're having a difficult time finding food, getting their footing. People are dying from sickness, from starvation. It's a very difficult time for the Puritans. And at these times, the most distressed, there were but six or seven sound persons who, to their great commendations, be it spoken, spared no pains night nor day, but with abundance of toil and hazard of their own health, fetched them wood, made them fires, dressed them meat, made their beds, washed their loathed and clothed, clothed, clothed and unclothed them, in a word, did all the homely and necessary offices for them which dainty and queasy stomachs cannot endure to near named, and all this willingly and cheerfully, without any grudging in the least, showing herein their true love unto their friends and brethren, a rare example and worthy to be remembered. Now, something else that was very important to the Puritans, we're going to talk about again um, in our second part, is this idea of community. The Puritans were very focused on community, and what you can notice in this from chapter 9 to chapter 11 in chapter 9, it's written in the first-person perspective. William Bradford is using I a lot. But in chapter 11, when he's talking about the trials that, the, that his group is going through, he suddenly shifts He suddenly shifts to using, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, third-person plural. The third-person plural pronoun, there, they. He shifts from uh, a first-person perspective to more of a third-person perspective, which might show us what? Why might, what might be significant about that shift from the first person to the third person? He goes to talk, he starts, he starts writing in the third person when they start talking about some of their most trying times and these people in the community who stood up and helped take care of other people. Why might he start to talk about people collectively instead of using the word I so much? Maybe the trying to like show like how the community about it. Dan? Trying to like to show like the community in a way. Focusing a little bit more on the yeah. shared struggle. Yeah. Okay. So you got this idea that in shifting away from using first person to third person, he's talking about things a little bit more and putting emphasis on the community as a whole instead of himself. And that was something that was very important to the Puritans was community and society and, and kind of working together for the benefit of everyone. That's not a bad idea at all. And that will also eventually evolve into that, you know, more democratic enlightenment principles as we move on. Talking about that, then, when we go back over to um, this section about all their trials and stuff and um, how eventually things start to get better, we kind of highlight that a little bit more, okay? We're talking, we're seeing them come through these struggles together as one unit, as one group together, okay? And so that's sort of an important part that eventually becomes more about this. We want to shift back and say about the American identity again. This shared struggle, this communal approach to life, okay? You can kind of see how these things can play into one another. Any guy, any thoughts on that at all before we move on? We need to move on to John Smith if we can. So if you have some final thoughts about anything we just said or anything else, that will be a good time to talk about it. Any ideas? You've all done a pretty good job so far. I'm really happy with the conversation we've been having. This is great. So overall, overall, what we kind of get from Plymouth Plantation, um, we see, we get a really good look at how faith plays a big role in the early Puritans and how, you know, their beliefs and how it drives everything they do. We get a good look into their sense of community. Again, it's really important here, the fact that he, even though he's speaking in this third person perspective, again, to kind of try and show community more over the self. He elevates those people. He doesn't name them by name, but he elevates those people who are not sick, who are able to step up and do the work and help one another and push through that. Push that. He talks about the hard work they put in, how, um, you know, how, um, how focused and dedicated they are. You can kind of start to get that idea again. Um, think about it from the perspective of like trials, of tests, God putting you through trials and they, you know, coming out the other end. There's this idea that through every trial the Puritans go through and come out the other end, they're pleasing God. God's putting them through all these tests. He put them through the storms in the sea. He puts them through the starving time. He puts them through relations with the Indians. And every single time, they're coming out for the better, 
right? So there's this kind of idea that all these things are trials, all these things are tests done by God and by doing things, by coming on the other end, by working hard, by sticking to their faith beliefs, um, and by honoring God, they're going to come out for the better of it in regardless of how much hardship they go through. So that's also something that really eventually will, you know, this idea of if you work hard, if you contribute to your community, if you focus on what's right and good in life and work through the troubles, you'll be successful. What does that sound like? There's something, there's two words, very popular phrase, work hard, stay focused, you'll be successful. What is that called? Two words. The American dream. <laughs> You're starting to see a little bit of the foundations of this thing we eventually call the American dream. Come over to America, make a war name for yourself, work hard, stay the stay the um, keep the faith, stay the track, focus, do the good thing, and you'll be successful in this land of opportunity. That's what we're kind of starting to see take place here. You guys get that? We all with that? Let's take a shift over to John Smith real quick and talk about another side of the American identity. We won't spend a lot of time on this one because there's just a few things I want to point out and we need to um, we need to take a break if we're going to get to the other lecture part of this. So, John Smith, again, most of you know John Smith from what? Uh, Pocahontas. Pocahontas, right, of course. Um, he was not blind. He was not voiced by Mel Gibson. Um, he was, um, and the whole... Pocahontas story is mostly not true. Yes. Uh, that's John Smith, but here's an interesting thing. We talked about this in class today. John Smith had a habit of lying and embellishing, right? And we talked last class about how we all kind of do that, especially when we're in a place that's new and we're in a new place and we have an opportunity to reinvent ourselves. We have an opportunity to be somebody else, maybe change the way we're perceived. You know, I'm not saying that's necessarily what John Smith did, but there's certainly some... Some threads there with that. Um, so let's talk a little bit. So what we really have here, um, like I said, is really, these are just kind of correspondences. Um, and the thing that he's talking about, what he opens with in this selection, is he's explaining why a massacre occurred. Um, so there was a massacre of settlers. So natives came in and massacred some settlers. And he's talking about why this occurred. Um, and, uh, but he basically says that, you know, it happened, and they came over because they wanted our weapons, and they wanted our novelty items, but you shouldn't worry about it too much, because, you know, that's not a reason not to come over here to America. And remember, John Smith comes over to America, not for the same reason that the Puritans did. John Smith comes over to America for, like I said, for wealth, uh, for, to make a name for himself, uh, for uh, property, for all these sort of adventurous um, glory yeah, personal gain, you know, that's, and that was always a big thing, especially in the old days, and it still is, really. You know, we do things because we want people to remember us. We want to stake our claim in history and have people know us and who we were, and they want us, we want to see us a certain way. Um, and so that's kind of what we have with John Smith here. Um, let's read. Did anybody, starting off, anything that, I know this was a little bit more of a difficult reading, so anything right off the bat that you noticed or picked up on that you'd want to discuss about this? I just had a question. Okay. Why were they written like this? Like, <laughs> this is just how they wrote. It's how they wrote and talked back That's, then. It's just the style. Yeah. I know. Um, I'm kind of like looking at like Shakespeare stuff. And not in like reading Shakespeare. That's just how they were. That's how they were. Footnotes. And I don't know. Did you guys, did the footnotes copy pretty well in the things, the little things down at the bottom? Mm -hmm. These really help with these kind of readings. These footnotes down here, those really help. Um, they're, they're also, I mean, the, you got footnotes in your uh, textbook as well, but these really help, especially because some of the words that they use, you know, words change meanings over time, and there's some words we don't use anymore, and some words that meant something once and now mean something completely different, called the slippage of language, and so, um, and so we have that a lot in these old writings, words that we're not, familiar, we don't, it's hard for us to understand the vocabulary, because we don't use that kind of vocabulary anymore. Let's, any, um, but that's I mean, it's just the way that they wrote back then. That's the way that they talked and did all that. Any other thoughts about this? Okay, so I was going to say. You and then, and then it's a So, like, I thought it was really weird how he was, like, after he came over, 
Um, so, if I'm not mistaken, um, <laughs> he was a leader, um, in this colony at one point in time. He was a leader in Jamestown. Um, and so he, not so much president, but of Jamestown where he was, um, he was a he, w he was considered a social and political leader of the time. He actually had a lot to do with the development and the sustainment and the survival of that of that clock at the same time. So he was a leader. Um, no, in that in that situation, uh, what you have with that approach is more of a um, well. Let's let's read about that real quick, and then uh, let's read, and then we'll, we'll go to your point. So I'm just going to start from the beginning. Here, I must entreat a little your favors to digress. They did not kill the English because they were Christians, but for their weapons and commodities. So he's talking about the natives who have come over and slaughtered the settlers. He's trying to tell them they didn't kill us because of our beliefs. It's not a religious war. It's not because of that. They just killed us because they wanted our stuff. That were, uh, to, that were rare novelties. But now they fear we may beat them out of their dens, which lions and tigers would not admit but by force. So he's basically talking about his bravery. They're afraid of us. More than they are lions and tigers or any other fearful beast. You know, they're they're afraid of us because we'll come and beat them out. Um, and you know, because we're willing to go deep into their dens that not even these fierce animals would go into. Okay. But must this be an argument for an Englishman or discourage any uh, any either in Virginia or New England? Saying, is this a reason for you not to come over here? No, for I have tried them both. For Virginia, I kept that country with 38 and had not to eat but what we had from the savages. What he means there is that with 38 men, he beat back all the savages. Fought them off. Just 38 men, very few things. So we're starting to see right off the bat whether or not that's true, this kind of idea of, you know, yeah, the natives, they're restless, they're difficult to deal with, they might come over and hurt you, but you shouldn't be afraid of them because I can, I, I can take them with just a handful of guys, you know, with our weapons and our... Uh, English prowess and our um, our strength, we can we can take care of them easily. There's no reason for you to not to come explore and make you know a name for yourself in new land because we can take them out. When I had ten men able to go abroad, our commonwealth was very strong. With such a number, I ranged an unknown country fourteen weeks. I had but eighteen to subdue them all. With which great army I stayed six weeks before their greatest king's habitations till they had gathered together all the power they could, and yet the Dutchman sent at a needless excessive charge did help Powhatan how to betray him. Um, what he means by that, if you look at that, if you have that footnote, several Dutch, probably German skilled workers, had been shipped to Virginia in 1608, sent to build a house for Powhatan. They hinted to him that they would take his side against the English. So they came and kind of, Powhatan was, I think, talking on his dad in real life, yeah. Um... And so, arrested by the English and brought back to Jamestown for execution, they were saved and a new ship arrived from England, bringing fresh supplies and important new instructions for President Smith and Virginia's government council. Um, so, he's just kind of talking about that, you know, that relation there. If you go down in that second part, um, uh, let's just start. For wronging a soldier but the value of a penny, I have caused Powhatan to send his own men to Jamestown to receive their punishment at my discretion. Okay, so you're talking about executing these, these Native Americans. It is true in our greatest extremity they shot me, slew three of my men, and by the folly of them that fled took me prisoner. Yet God made Pocahontas, the king's daughter, the means to deliver me, and thereby taught me to know their treacheries to preserve the rest. It was also by chance in single combat to take the king of Pasparega's prisoner, and by keeping him forced his subjects to work in chains till I made all the country pay contribution having little else whereon to live. So it means it's kind of showing his dominance over the over the natives, yes. He's talking a lot about his, his ability to dominate over the native population, showing his strength, showing his prowess. Again, we're trying to talk, um, is it, what, it, what I have in my notes here, Smith furgers his argument by giving examples of his own power over Native Americans, both the lay people and their chiefs. Furthermore, he asserts he never suffered great hurt at the hands of the natives, which is funny, because he talks, he got shot, and got captured, and three of his men died, and it was the chief's daughter who helped him escape, but he's still going to sit there and say, it's not that bad. You know, we can take it. We're doing fine. So, 
I would be willing to think that if I got shot and three of my friends got killed and I got drug into and captured, you know, that would be a little bit embarrassing for me as a military leader, especially one with guns and ships and sharper swords and you're fighting these Native Americans who may have some of that stuff, but for the most part are still going to be using primitive weapons. Maybe John Smith is a little bit embarrassed. Maybe his manhood has been a little bit stung just a little bit. Okay, but what's what we have, but again, what he's doing is just showing us how, even though some bad things have happened, how a strong, brave man like myself and my men have been able to overcome the natives and how we can fight them and we can take them over. And he's kind of bragging about how he was able to subject the chiefs and the lay people to his own will. Okay, so he's trying, again, a show of strength is what we have here, okay? Uh, let's see. And, and this is the, the next paragraph. Twice in this time I was their president, and none can say in all that time I had a man slain. But for keeping them in that fear, I was much blamed for both here and there. Yet I left 500 behind me that through their confidence in six months came to most confusion, as you may read at large in the description of Virginia. So he's just talking about, again, once again, his confidence as a leader and his prowess. So let's talk a little bit about that. Well, actually, what, let's see. What, so, Connie, what did you have to say? And did, and did anything we just read have anything to do with? I was going to say how the Native Americans were kind of served in like a negative light, like seen, seen as more hostile. They were called savages. Right. And in a way, and it's like I had some questions from like, and like what would it have been like from their point of view of all of this mm -hmm. to just like all of a sudden have people come in where to a place where you've been living you know, like mm -hmm. all of your life and then all of a sudden they come in and they're like this is our land now leave yeah and so that and so i was thinking that might have been the reason why they tried to kill the like we're killing settlers because it still wouldn't be for like a belief of god mm -hmm. but it would be in the you're in our home. Right. Why are you here? Right. And it's kind of like the why was it probably one of the exact reasons why they were considered savages. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's that, and then there's also the idea. Remember that these men are coming over with civilization, right? The Englishmen are the more advanced, right? We're more advanced. We have civilization. We have systems of government and merchants and trade and yada yada yada. Our inventions are superior. Our ideas and beliefs are superior. So when they come and meet these natives who are still living a very simple, nomadic, agrarian-based lifestyle, they think, well, all savages. You know, they don't know anything about the good world, the real world, yada, yada, yada. And so what they do is they treat them significantly less than human, do they not? Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about maybe some a negative aspect of the overall American identity. What we have here, long before America was a, the United States of America was a thing, you still have this idea that as, especially as the white man, but just in general, as let's say, I mean, and yes, his skin color has a lot to do with it here, but also the fact that he simply was the more advanced man, the powerful man, the one with the better government, the one with the better weapons, the one with the better beliefs and ideals and modes of transportation and approaches to life. And the way that he subjects the natives and treats the natives not as people so much as pawns or as a... Um, mild inconvenience or as something less than human, okay? This is something that's going to mar the American identity for years to come because our treatment of the Native Americans is not only atrocious and a tragedy, but this, this idea continues well into the 18, even 1900s. We have the Trail of Tears. We have all the relocations. We have the reservations. But then there's also this idea of... Because, guys, if we're going to talk about the American identity, we can't, I cannot sit here and be honest and uh, expect you to get a good, true, honest education without us acknowledging the negative criticisms of what it means to be an American sometimes. Okay, It's just not fair to not do that. Again, I'm not going to fall on either side of an argument here, but you have to understand that there is this, there are people out there and there are historical events that show that Americans, especially those Americans who are in power, have a habit of subjecting other people, other types of people, um, whether it be natives, whether it be African Americans, whether it be people in foreign lands, subjecting them to this will, this belief, this will of ours, in order for our advancement. We had it with the natives, we had it with slaves, we have it with, some would criticize our constant 
um, our constant military presence around the world. That's an issue of criticism that you can tie in here. So what do we think about that a little bit? What do we think maybe about how this might show a little bit more of the negative side of that American identity a little bit? And is it is it is it strictly American? Because right now these guys aren't wrong. This isn't the United States. All right? This is just, this is more of a Eurocentric worldview. So what do we think about that a little bit? It's the God complex God complex? Yeah. Okay, no, keep I mean, going. I mean, like, they come over here and act like they know more and they know they because they want their own way of life. And then when the people don't want to conform to their ideas and don't want to just change their lives completely because of the same ones that they're the ones that, that are being attacked for it. And I think that can, like, it still happens today. It happens all the time. Like, mm-hmm. it never went away after that. Mm-hmm. Ava and Nancy Kanye. Okay, I think a lot of people do, and I agree. Like, I like, I mean, not like, I see how far, like, my American church stays, like, the beginnings of America versus today, how we still have a lot of issues, but how somehow we got some of it figured out in Christianity. But that just shows that we shouldn't still be having the same issues. Mm-hmm. Good. I was going to say, this is like with the God complex. I wouldn't say much of a God complex, but more of a superiority complex. Okay. Um, and seeing themselves as more of like the superior of the two. Because mm-hmm. it's like, like I said, they were seen like the Americans were seen as savages. Mm-hmm. And going through history, a lot of other races like African Americans and like Spanish and many other people were also seen as like inferior or mm-hmm. savages that needed to be civilized. And so it's like kind of them being like, oh, we're helping them in mm-hmm. a way because they're, we're making them like us, civilized and mannered like us. Okay. So they're not savages. Right. When in actuality, they're kind of just, it's not, they're not really helping us, but more forcing us. Dominating them. Stably. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, okay, so another consideration. So it's crazy how the settlers, how they thought they were doing it right, but they didn't take the time to actually learn from the natives of like their way of living to realize that maybe they're not the savages maybe we are. Okay. Okay, that's an interesting thought. Anybody else have anything you want to add to that at all? Any other thoughts? Genesis? Well, one thing I was saying, when you say that word that well, not word that, but that part when you say the race, there's gradation in the two races now. Mm-hmm. So, I'm not really going to say that. It's okay. <laughs> you get caught up in all these ideas you start having, and you okay. they get you they get mixed up. It's all right. Okay, you can come back. Cause I was okay. About it. Honestly, I it's like, like you can kind of see where segregation started. In okay. Life. Well, let's talk about that for a real quick second. Racism and prejudice and ideas of my society or my race or my culture is superior to your culture based off a myriad of reasons is something that has existed forever and will continue to exist for a long time, potentially forever. Now, but what we notice and what kind of starts here, or what we can kind of say is kind of a starting year, and we're going to see cycle through over and over and over and over again throughout American history, is that let's start with John Smith. I'm this new man in this new land of opportunity. This, the air is fresh. The ground is, is, is fertile. The land is plentiful. It's a land of opportunity. You can come reinvent yourself. You should come reinvent yourself. You should come explore here and make a name for yourself, right? This sort of idea of this land of opportunity, right? For you, but not for these guys. Fast forward a few years later. Um, you kind of have some of the same ideas with the Puritans. Maybe not as... In some cases, it's just as bad as we're going to see when we get to Nathaniel Hawthorne especially, but you kind of see this, we're here to make a new life for ourselves, to um, to be able to worship how we want to, unless you believe this way, well then no, because we're still, because the Puritans are still very intolerant. Well, then you have the Founding Fathers come up, and we believe, now we've got all these Enlightenment ideas, and these these, uh, these more secular and, and progressive ideas about freedom of speech, and freedom of religion, and Freedom to assemble and all these things that you can do, all these freedoms, these God-given freedoms to us, except for African Americans or people who don't own land or women. 
And then fast forward a few hundred more years, and suddenly, well, now we're going to bring, technically, we're going to bring African Americans into the fold. Now we're going to bring women into the fold. And in the 1960s, we actually do some more legislation to really make it work for African Americans. And then we deal with just the effects of that. So over and over and over throughout our history, you see these cycles of trying to apply these good ideas, these good ideals. There's nothing wrong with some of the ideals on the face. Freedom of religion, freedom to do what you want, be who you are. Those are good things. But who they apply to, we see kind of change, and we expand them as our, as our understanding of the world grows, as our understanding of different cultures and diversity grows. These ideals are expanded to larger and larger groups of people. But it's a constant fight, it's a constant struggle of those who are underrepresented or those who are oppressed to be given those same beliefs, the same rights, the same things that America apparently stands for. So this is something you're going to see cycle through the history, especially in literature, over and over and over again. One pattern I kind of see with like things like that is like you can do this, but if you believe in this, you can't do it. It's like uh, women and African Americans are they're kind of seen as mostly affected by this because like women weren't really given many rights. They were mostly seen as like pretty much dirty. Mm-hmm. Pretty much, that's what they were seen as. And if, if like, this lady, this intelligent, say, like, this intelligent woman is trying to run for president, they'd be like, no, 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 you should be at the house cleaning mm-hmm. and cooking for your husband and having children. And, like, African Americans, they're seen as more of, like, inferior and seen as, like, no, you should be working out in the field while mm-hmm. you're doing math there and, like, and and such and such and such. And so it's kind of like those two people are seen as mostly doing that, but also others as well. And you're also going to see this idea that those who are less civilized, less cultured, who are beneath us, are therefore should be subjugated. And it's not only that we can, but we should subjugate them to our way of to our way of life because we're the superior ones. They're just tools. They're just pawns. They're just property. You're going to see that. Uh, Genesis, didn't you, did you have your hand up a second ago? I did, but I answered on the first. Okay. Okay, I'll let you like tell what Ava said about um, having the same problems that we did like thousands of years ago. Mm-hmm. I I agree, and I also like to point out how not like we may have like we solved those a bunch of issues at the time, like um, some things like we're not the same, but we still have like when we advance in our civilization, we have more issues that come up, and it's the same basis like they may not be the same issues but it still has the same uh, ideals and i like yeah. columns behind yeah. it as it did like a long time ago to now like so like the religion and how it is mm-hmm. it's just presented in different ways different same thing topics. different situation different yeah. people that you're getting at do what yes repeat repetition of history yeah. hold on one quick we haven't, I know, you all both talked a little bit, but do y'all have anything you want to add to this at all? I don't want to call on the same people too much. Do you have any thoughts about this? Any perspectives at all that you want to add to this? Or something different? If you want to, I mean, if you have another note, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about one more thing with John Smith in just a moment. And then we're going to, guys, are y'all okay if we skip our break? Because it's 9.03 and I've got a little bit more I need to talk about, like, like from before we, are y'all okay with that? Okay. So Ava, what were you going to say? Okay. So I like how she said, um, I think that's what's going to happen a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, even get back to Jesus and Exodus and everything, if you really pay attention to the Bible, you can see everything happening. Like, slavery, how the Egyptians enslaved every uh, the Israelites and all of that. And, like, um, if you go back with Noah and his sons and how he had a um, all of that went down and how that's how not we pissed off like the races but how the uh, top races are getting killed because of uh, what's his name? Okay, Ham, Sham. <laughs> you going way back. And <laughs> his name, the host of that. Woo! But yeah, so Ham, Ham's descendants are the African Americans, so all of his children moved to Africa and all the um, those places, and I think Shem, I think those were the 
um, do Asians and Middle Eastern, and then I can post that with the links. And oh, so okay. what happened was when um, Noah used to get drunk a lot, because God gave him the gift of uh, making some really good wine. And so God told, he got drunk one, one day he got drunk, and God told his sons not to go in the tent with him because he had taken off all his clothes and he didn't, he didn't want them to see him and stuff all the way. But Ham went in, and so God punished him and said that your descendants will be the uh, sacred race. And so that's why a lot of racism happens if you go back in the Bible and everything. And so um, he, he um, that's why people think that the African Americans are the, the sacred race and why everything bad, well, not everything bad, but like a lot of bad things happen to them. And yeah. So I want to take what you said and kind of tie that in to a couple of last points here because I, what, what, what I think is interesting about that um, is the fact that you'll notice. In a lot of the writings we read, and if you really look at even, if you go back and you look at even some of the defenses of slavery, there's still a faith element to all this kind of stuff, okay? So we're going to see in our readings as well how faith can play a very positive role and does play a very positive role in the development of the nation. We're also going to see how faith is often used as an excuse to commit atrocity. Because you'll notice that um, this idea that we are the, whether it's we're the chosen race or we're the more advanced people or we're the more advanced society, there's always this element of this sort of like divinity behind it. This is what God wants from us. This is how God, this is what God will, this is what God means for us to be. So there are, it, it, you do see elements of faith being used the wrong way, okay, throughout our history. Um, and, you know, that's one element right there. People can try and go back and find even things in the Bible and say, well, right here, right here, right here proves, you know, that, you know, you're supposed to be subjected to me. All that said, what you still really have is this sort of like, this sort of like, um, it's, it's, it's all, it's all, a, it's all a power spectrum. Okay. It's all, it's it all, again, it all kind of comes down to this power spectrum. So there's this belief that if we are the more advanced species, the more advanced race, the more cultured, if we have things more figured out, then we have a right, not just the, not just the ability, but all, in a lot of ways a right to subjugate those who we consider to be less than us um, to whatever we please. And again, we'll notice over the course of our history and through all kinds of different literature that we read, sort of this revelation that those ideals are wrong. And on one hand, you have to, I don't want to say empathetic or sympathetic, because you shouldn't be, but you have to at least understand a little bit that a lot of these people are really products of their time. They think a certain way because that's the way that the world was. That doesn't make what they believe objectively right. It doesn't change the fact that things they believe were wrong, but you can also see why they believe these things. And so that's, that's an important thing to think about as we move through. But overall, with John Smith... We do have this, we do have some of, some shades of the negative idea of the American identity, all right, or the ne or, or even some shades, maybe even some, um, some early, early um, examples of the issues that we faced in this sort of power dynamic over our years of expanding our beliefs and our ideals of freedom and things to different groups of people as we become a little bit more um, as our eyes open a little bit more to the equality of different peoples and things like that. But the other thing you have, I guess which you could might consider a more positive if you want to, I mean, it could be positive or negative, but John Smith still embodies this sort of like bold, strong, courageous, um, uh, adventurous, resourceful man who is out here making it on his own, doing his thing, and that is also a very key part of the American identity. And we, we will see that in the Puritans, too. It's hard work, it's dedication, it's courage. You ever heard the phrase, fortune favors the bold? You ever heard that before? It's a very popular phrase around Europe um, and in all kind of different cultures. But this idea that fortune favors the bold, is, you know, fortune is going to favor those who are the strongest, who are the bravest, who are the most courageous, right? 
that's a very significant portion of the American identity as an American person, that we are these individuals, that we're strong, that we're self-reliant. And we're going to see that also again with the Puritans as well, which I'm about to talk about. So let's go ahead and move over to that real quick before we run out of time. Um, we could go on about this all day, um, but we have to, you know, level it out at some point. So just real quick, I want to talk a little bit more about Puritan's contribution to the American way of life, and we're going to see some connections in some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, and... Um, um, and see how all these things will eventually thread together. So we already talked about how the Puritans and the Pilgrims were two different groups of settlers. One of them were separatists. That was William Bradford's crew. They were separatists. Um, then you actually had the Puritans who didn't want to separate from the church. who wanted to purify the church from within. Very large group of settlers, a lot of them fairly wealthy, um, spread out all over New England, okay, so they're, um, they, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Maine, they got here and they kind of spread out all over New England. And like I said, they compare their travels to the biblical story of Exodus. They saw themselves as chosen by God to create a new, pure Christian utopia. That was one of the reasons they came over here, to create sort of a Christian utopia. Now, let's think about that for a second. If you have a group of people who come over who have been chosen by God, so there's that idea, again, of this divine providence that we're meant to be here to create a Christian utopia, which eventually does become America, okay? Eventually, all the things that they started in eventually become America. How do you think you're going to react? Again, if you're chosen by God, we just talked about this a second ago, how would you react to a native population who's not Christian? Hostile, maybe, or you're going to think of them as lesser than you are, right? Okay? Um, they believed that if they honored God, that their society would be blessed and that it would succeed. And if they failed to honor God, their, their colony would be punished. This obsession with honoring God made American Puritanism very strict. It was a very severe religious movement. So again, we've talked a little bit about sort of the positive aspects of this, but we have to understand that the Puritans were extremely theologically strict. I mean, these are the people that committed the Salem Witch trials after all. Okay. Religious conformity was very important. Community harmony was very important, but within under the umbrella of religious conformity. So they saw so this idea, this idea of like community, and taking care of one another and being in harmony with one another, this very good enlightenment collectivist idea that's very good for the establishment of society existed only under the umbrella of religious conformity. So that's an important point that you're going to want to remember. Um, an interesting thing is that was their migration to the Puritans was overwhelmingly family-based, whereas John Smith is a group of people coming over for individual reasons. So we have, again, in John Smith, we have this, this uh, idealization of the individualist perspective of the American identity, that's strong, bold, courageous, whereas with the Puritans came over lots of families, so you have an extra element to that communal way of life. This is important. Literacy was very high. Okay, Christianity, everywhere that Christianity went, starting in the first century AD, Christianity, one of the big things that it did that was good is it brought literacy to the world. And a lot of now, not everywhere. Obviously, there were literacy in other parts of the world long before Christians did. But Christians in there and a lot of uh, the places they went, especially if you go back to British history. Christianity is one of the sole reasons that we have literacy in England in the first place. Um, so there's a lot, that's, and that's important too. Literacy was very high, so that's when we have a lot of these, a lot of the early American writings that we're going to read are diaries, are personal poetry, letters, sermons, things like that, because these are the things that people wrote all the time. They, I mean, they, they knew how and they did. Do I believe that beliefs can be wrong? Technically, yes. Beliefs can be wrong um, objectively. That doesn't stop people from believing them. I mean, I can tell you right now that I believe that the world is run by lizard people. Am I right? I'm not right, but... <laughs> Hold on. Put, put, put a pin in that. We'll, come, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, 
Let me see. I'm all on the place here. Okay. So, um, one of the things is Puritans gave Americans a sense of history as a progressive drama under the direction of God. Right? So, again, this idea that we are progressing through history, that these things are ordained by God. If we pass the trials and do the right thing and honor God and please God, then we are going to succeed. What does that look like? Hard work, communal living, devotion, focusing on the important things. Again, this are these seeds of what we call the American dream, even though it's kind of based in early, in these, we read it's kind of based in these early ideas of religious devotion, and that's going to evolve over the years to be able to go away from if we honor God completely, he's going to bless us, to if you work hard and stay the course, then you will find success. You're going to see that shift a little bit from more of a religious idea to a more enlightenment, classically liberal idea. Um, it, uh, let's see. Um, it did bring with it um, some of these, like I said, these newer ideas, these newer political ideas. Um, in attempting to emulate the earliest Christian communities, they turned their backs on golden thrones of popes and kings. So the Puritans kind of, and again, remember when we, the other day we talked about that parallel between breaking away from the church in England to 100 years later when the patriots break away from England as a whole? So this idea of sort of turning away from the crown, in their sense, turning away from Rome, but also turning away from this idea of a monarchy and to a, to a um, turning away from that kind of stuff to more of a personal focus on, um, um, on, on hard work and devotion to God on your own, that was fairly revolutionary. So they're kind of turning away from all these you know, ideas of authority and putting all authority directly to God, okay? All authority directly to God. We're bypassing the king, we're bypassing the pope, we're going directly to God now. And so that, again, kind of helps you know, thread this needle of turning away from the crown eventually, breaking away people, um, that idea of self-government. Um, there, um, let's see. Yeah, but there's a really good point here I'm trying to find. Um, okay, yeah, so their idea of personal integrity, that's a very important part. They had this very strong focus on personal integrity. But what's important, again, and one of the things that I really want to make sure we focus on, we've got about 10 minutes or so left, uh, one of the things to focus on is that what started out as these religious doctrines eventually becomes more secularized and generalized. So the original Puritan community could summon death-defying strength in individual bearers, valiant against all disasters. The Puritans had a very good, um, or were very uh, talented when it came to getting through hardships. We saw this in a Plymouth plantation, right? When he talks about how there was this starving time. Well, actually, we start. We talk about the um, we talk about the storms at sea, and then when they're starving, their relations again, their relations with the natives. All these trials they go through. They had a really good um, uh, they had a really good way of getting through all these troubles and trials and finding success afterwards. So again, what they saw then as good divine providence, think that's that thing that eventually develops into this American dream idea. Puritans drew from his, the idealization of personal responsibility, personal responsibility, a theory of individual rights, which secularized and generalized was to be among the most potent explosives the world has known. Okay, so again, we're taught this idea of this um, self-preservation, of individual rights, of personal responsibility to yourself and to God, not to any pope or to any king. These ideas, again, these are the things that eventually evolve become more secularized and end up being the founding ideals that are written into the Constitution. Are you guys seeing these connections I'm talking about? I know I'm sound, I feel like I sound repetitive, but I'm just trying to show how all these early things that the Puritans did eventually led themselves you know, to, these, um, to these ideals. Okay? And, so, um, and so because of that, what we can kind of see is Puritanism is, you know, like I said, it eventually goes from religious, religious doctrine to political theory. Now, it's not just the Puritanisms that had this. You're, what you're going to have later in the 1700s is the Enlightenment, 
that's going to come in and kind of combine with some of these ideals, and that's where a lot of our America and these good American ideals come from, okay? So just a couple more notes there on some of the um, contributions that the Puritans gave to us. Again, even though I have strong disagreements with their theoret or their theologies and their approach and their intolerance, they still did some things, planted some foundations that eventually come to be these very specific, important parts of what we consider to be this American identity. We're going to explore that a little bit more in our next few readings, okay? So here's what you have to read next. Um, you are going to read... See, not that. All right, starting on page 76, I need you to read the nar a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mary Rowlandson. I would strongly suggest that you read page 74 and page 75 first to get some background. So I'm going to write uh, 74 through 79. All right, that's the captivity and restoration of Mary Rowlandson. Mary Rowlandson was a Puritan woman who is captured by natives and by these nomadic natives. And this is her little novel that she writes about it. it is like her diary entries of just the different, um, her travels with them and pretty much being their prisoner. All right, and then um, starting on page 84 and 85, there are two poems by Anne Bradstreet. So that is Upon the Burning of Our House and To My Dear and Loving Husband. All right. So Anne Bradstreet. Okay, and that's going to be pages 84 and 85. Okay? And then, one more. I would read, I want you to read the background on page 88 of John Edwards. So that's going to be 88 through 92. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. This is a sermon. to Okay, so in the captivity and restoration of Marilyn Rowlandson, you're going to get a little bit more insight into this Puritan idea of being sort of a elect, a chosen person, someone who strongly believes that God is bringing her through trials. There's going to be a lot to talk about there. We're going to get to see a little bit more insight into, um, uh, and there's some stuff in here that they didn't include in this selection that's in my selection. So when we talk about this, I'll probably bring up a couple of the pieces out of this. But we're going to talk about that. And you're going to see, like I said, more of this, um, the Puritan belief, the idea of being tested, the idea of God putting his chosen through trials. Remember, they like the Puritan ideology and the Calvinist belief believed in something called predestination, which means that God already knows who all is going to go to heaven and who's not going to go to heaven. Okay? And so in, in believing that, they believed that there were a certain number of elect people who were elected to already go to heaven, and those who were the elect had to basically keep up, um, had to go through all these trials, meet all these tests, and pass all these tests that God put them through. Um, Upon the Burning of Our House and To My Dear and Loving Husband are two poems written by a Puritan woman. Again, you're going to get some more thoughts, some more um uh, a look into their um, to their religious beliefs and how they see God as bringing them through all kinds of stuff. And then Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God is a famous um, um, is a uh, famous uh, sermon written by John Edwards, who um, and it's uh, it's it's uh, what you call the sort of like the um, uh, fire and brimstone kind of stuff. You've heard that term before, fire and brimstone. That's what we have with this right here. This is going to give you a little bit more of a perspective into what they 
a little bit more of their theology, what they believed about God, what they believed about life at that time. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, John Edward, anybody in here watch Hamilton yet? Do you love it? I love this. Watched it a hundred times. Um, John Edwards is Aaron Burr's grandfather, in case you didn't know that. Um, and so we might talk some connections there. But anyway, so these three things, same thing I want you to do as you did last time, okay? Read, all right? I want you to write, um, I'm going to say two pages this time, not for each one, but total two pages. Summarize each of these readings, Okay. And then um, pick out uh, a couple points or a couple questions that you can bring that have to that you think is interesting. Um, don't just focus so much. We've talked so much about the contributions to the American identity. I feel like we've kind of developed a nice foundation of thought. We're continuing into uh, a little bit deeper into these early Puritan ideas, so we don't have to keep connecting everything to the American identity. We've already developed those connections. What we're going to see now is exploring those connections a little bit more. So you don't have to necessarily come up with a connection to the American identity, just so much some interesting things that you thought that you would like to discuss, whether it's theological, philosophical, social, whatever it may be. Even if it's an approach like, for example, with Anne Bradstreet, you could talk about the, her idea of love and her approach to love under the type of theology that she believes in. Okay? Does that make sense? What do you guys think about this format? of class so far. Are you enjoying it? Do you feel like you're learning something? Okay, it's a little open-ended, so I just wanted to make sure that we feel, um, I mean, you guys did a really good job today. This is exactly what I'm looking for, um, and I want you guys to continue reading, trying, and coming to class prepared. So the, is this, so this is working for everybody so far? Okay, good. All right, so um, tomorrow is Wednesday, and I just don't remember what I do on my little piece of paper. Uh, maybe I left it over here. But with tomorrow being Wednesday, we have um, a different schedule. And I don't have it for right now, but tomorrow you're supposed to kind of go on a. Let me go ahead and stop this. Tomorrow is basically.